Yeah, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Joe. I'm the ops manager here and one of the member of the congregation. Been here for about six months and loving it. And I'm also Lauren's husband. Um, our scripture reading this morning is uh, Romans 12. So we're going to start at verse 1. That can be found on page 1139 in our Pew Bibles. And we're going to read the first couple of verses and then we're going to jump down to verse 9. So therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing and perfect will. And then down to verse 9. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil and cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honour one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervour, serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you and do not curse. Rejoice with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited, and do not repay evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. Amen. Now, as Lauren said, we're looking and thinking about worship this morning. And if you've been in church for a while, when you hear the word worship, you're probably thinking of what goes on up here with our bands and our uh, musicians, and there's probably a, a song that you might think of. But while music is a wonderful part of our worship, it is only that, a part of it. True worship is more than just our singing. The song we sang, the final song we sang, says, I'll bring you more than a song, for a song in itself is not what you've required. You search much deeper within through the way things appear. You're looking at our hearts, our hearts of worship. So what is worship, and where is that word from? Well, the word worship comes from an old English word, which means, as Lauren said, worship. It literally means to give something worth, to demonstratively attribute value, especially a deity or a god. Worship is putting the value you hold to something on display. And we do that for a number of different things. We moved back to Suffolk about a year ago, uh, having spent most of my life living in London. And I'm learning a few things about Suffolk. One of them is whereas in London we tend to take consonants out of words, in Suffolk you tend to add them in. So it's no longer a floor, it's a floor. And you don't shut a door, you shut a door. And I'm also learning if you take the front and the last letter off of those words and you end up with an oor, that can pretty much be an answer to anything. Oor here, or... I don't know, have you heard about that? Ooh, and I'm really learning these things. The other thing I'm learning about Suffolk is, I don't do glass recycling here, unlike London. It's like going back into the 1990s, having to take all these bottles to the bank. And you know what, I'm having to decide, I'm having to strategically decide which bottle bank I go to each week, because people are going to start worrying the amount of glass bottles that I'm putting <laughs> in a bin each week. But one of the other things about coming back to Suffolk that I've noticed, or I've been part of, is the resurgence of the football team. My goodness, you know, I come back to Suffolk and we've only been here a year and they've only lost about three or four games in that time and everyone's telling me, this isn't usual, don't get used to this, being an Ipswich Town fan is not that easy. Now, was there anybody here who was able to go to the parade? Anybody managed to make it down to the Ipswich Town parade? Oh, a few people, fantastic. And what a time of celebration, what a time of singing, of support, of worshipping the people who had got Ipswich Town up back into the Premier League. In Kieran McKenna, we trust. That is a form of worship. The idea of putting our worth, our value, our time, our effort, our energy into something. And so many people choose to do that and put it on display publicly. And it's not just footballers that we can worship. Other celebrities in our game, we, we just did about Taylor Swift. 550 million followers across her social platforms. 
Ronaldo, nearly a billion people follow him. And it's not just people or celebrities we find ourselves worshipping, is it? We can worship our families, our jobs, our phones, our dogs. People might worship the gym. I don't, as you can tell. People might worship Fortnite. People might worship all manner of things. You may have heard those expressions. She's a sun worshipper or he's a gym worshipper. If you're ever struggling to think about what it is you worship, you can ask yourself a question. What do I want to talk about? Where do I spend my money? What occupies my thoughts, my spare time? Chances are, in some way or another, you're worshipping that thing. If you were to check out Lauren and I's finances, particularly Lauren's, you'd find out that we worship a god called Amazon. Um, and maybe a few people out there as well on that same thing. But, you know, I'm sad to say that I'm pretty much addicted to almost worshipping my phone. It occupies so much of my time. It would be the first thing that I turn to in the, in the morning usually. It's normally the last thing to sort of touch in the evenings. I'm thinking about it. It's occupying my spare time. And it would be easy, wouldn't it, to say that, oh, a mobile phone is just a bit of a distraction. But when it damages relationships, when it takes time away from worshipping God, it becomes more of an issue, a modern-day idol, you could say. And having an interest or a desire to be healthy or a good father or to good mother, husband, to do jobs well is not a problem in itself. It's when these things we love and we associate more worth and start putting more value on them than we do on worshipping Jesus, he starts to get pushed out. And I've got an example to help us think about that. Who here can tell me what I've got here, children? Who knows what this is? What is it? It's a bike wheel, exactly. It's a bike wheel. And the wheel was invented close to 6,000 years ago, maybe even longer. And to be honest with you, it's one of those things that hasn't really changed all that much. When it was first invented, it was pretty much just used for grinding wheat and making flour and things like that. But quite quickly, people realised, oh, you can put a wheel on other stuff. It can help move things. You can put it on a chariot. You know, now we're talking really good fun. And a wheel, fundamentally, for all those years, hasn't really changed. You have the rim, you have the hub in the middle, and you have the spokes on the side. And what I want to think about this morning of our worship and of Jesus is him here in the centre. And he's in his rightful place, when he's in the centre, when he's the thing we're placing and attributing the most value and worth to, the wheel just turns beautifully, doesn't it? But you imagine if this hub part was up here, how would the wheel start turning then? You know, it would be a bit bumpy, wouldn't it? Things would be a bit uncomfortable. And it doesn't have to move far. We're not saying it's completely removed, but we're just saying it starts to move around. It starts getting a little bit bumpy, a little bit uncomfortable when we start putting other things ahead of Christ in that centre. We start worshipping other things. And what about our spokes? You can see these on the side. You may have lost a few of these spokes in your time and needing to replace some of these. The spokes represent all the parts that make up our worship. When we think of things like, in our reading there, prayer, serving, fellowship, even things like the use of our finances, all a part of our worship, all make up these spokes here. And if a few of those start getting a bit loose or a bit slack, our, wob our wheel, if you've ever been on a bike which has lost a few of its spokes, starts to wobble this way. So if we haven't got Jesus in the centre, we're bouncing this way. If we haven't got some of these spokes which make up our worship tight, we're wobbling this way. And before we know it, our lives can seem a bit unstable, a bit bumpy, a bit out of control. Perhaps we need to think this morning about that wheel. Is Jesus the centre of our lives? Is he where we spend our time, our effort, our energy, our money, our thoughts? Is that what we're worshipping? Or have we perhaps shifted him a little bit off-centre? Are there some of the ways in which we can worship we need to consider tightening up, just readjusting so that our journey, our ride becomes that little bit smoother? 
Our Bible reading challenges us to live our whole lives as living sacrifices. That is your true and proper worship. It's not just coming here on a Sunday morning and singing our songs. It's our whole lives. It's all those spokes. It's all those parts. In the song that we sang, The Heart of Worship, Matt Redman wrote that as a response to their church slightly losing its focus, its corporate focus in worship. The music and the performance had almost become what was being worshipped. As a leadership team, they made the decision to strip away all the instruments and all the tech and for a time just have their voices. And it was a response to that that Matt Redman wrote the song as a response reminding them that God looks at the heart of worship and he's asking us what offering are we bringing every time we come on a Sunday morning. Aside from writing that incredible song, Matt Redman, amazing sort of art and written lots of things. And one of the things that he said that's always stuck with me around worship is somebody asked him the question, because he's led worship for thousands of people at Soul Survivor and at different events, and somebody asked him, they said, Matt, are you ever worried about leading worship in front of all these people? Are you ever worried that, you know, God's not going to show up or it's not going to go quite to plan? And his response and what he said was just fascinating. He said, you know what? I never expect something to happen publicly that hasn't already happened privately. Matt Redman was willing to worship God in the same way in his bedroom with his family as he was in front of 5,000 people at Soul Survivor. What are we worshipping when no one is looking? So, Lots of things to think about how and who we worship, but I guess the question we're sort of left with is why do we worship? Well, we worship things because we're actively recognising Jesus as our creator and our saviour in doing so. Worship is part of the way in how we tell God that we love him. Worship is living, sorry, worship is our act of living out what we are grateful for that he has done. When we fail to worship, we're almost failing to appreciate or recognise the sacrifice that God has made for us. We want to tell people about it. We want to show this. This wants to count for something. And ultimately, worship is a way in which we spread and share the gospel. When our lives are about worshipping God, about showing who he is, not just on a Sunday morning, but all through our lives, that's contagious. That's interesting. People want to know about that. When our worship comes out of our church on a Sunday and into our whole lives, it informs our decisions, it informs what we do, it informs our outlook, where we spend our time, what we want to do, where we fellowship, all these things. That is contagious and that is what changes and transforms lives. It was fantastic to hear Jess and Ilya speak in this morning about uh, their, their finding Christ and then coming to faith. And one of the things that Jess said, which was really powerful, was that she said, She felt like she was welcomed and found people, a family in this place. Our hospitality is our worship. Who we are and how we treat other people is an act of worship. We need to think of our whole lives as that wheel. Jesus in the centre being the priority, being the thing that we worship. Do we need to perhaps readjust? Do we need to re-centre him and perhaps move other things out of that centre? And are there ways in which we worship Jesus that we need to consider just tightening up a little bit? Are there areas of our lives as we try and live as living sacrifices that we could change, that we could improve, and that we could uh, make better? Let's just pray before we invite Leslie up to come and lead us in our corporate prayers.